Water covers over 80% of our planet in endless oceans. For years, the high seas have served as a conduit for fantastic discoveries and a wellspring from which sustenance has sprung forth. Yet just as often, the seas have also set the stage for tragedy. Off the coast of Vietnam, an aircraft carrier is consumed in a raging inferno. A submarine sinks near the shipyards of Liverpool, claiming 99 souls in the process. Souls forever lost at sea. The late 1930s. Continental Europe finds itself on the brink of war. In London, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain quietly authorizes England's military complex to begin production on machines of war. Among these is the new T-Class of sub. Although a small ship, the T-Class is faster and designed to operate over long distances. They were a very formidable fighting vessel. They were the latest vessels of the day. We had uh, top-line craftsmen working on these engines and Lerds had a tremendous reputation in the Navy of building a good ship. By the beginning of 1939, the third of the T-Class subs nears completion at the Camel Laird shipbuilding yard in Birkenhead, three miles from Liverpool. Dubbed the HMS Thetis, she spans 270 feet and displaces 1,575 tons. Command of the ship falls to Lieutenant Commander Guy Bolas. As the ship nears completion, Lieutenant Frederick Woods is in Birkenhead to assist Commander Bolas during preliminary steerage and engine trials. Among the new crew of the Thetis is leading stoker Walter Arnold, who arrives on the naval barracks in Birkenhead with his wife and newborn son, Derek. Well, my father was a gentleman very mild-mannered, not demonstrative at all. He was a, a good engineer. He was a good draftsman. I think he'd been in the Navy for about 12, 15 years. He'd been in submarines for something in the region of six or seven years. Others find their time on the Thetis coming to a close, such as Camel Laird engineer fitter Frank Shaw. By April of 1939, the Thetis has a full crew of 34 men, but the Camel Laird engineers are still an integral part of the ship. The Navy were running the boat. The civilian engineers were there to, to operate the machinery, if you wish. But the command of the boat and the navigation uh, was done by the Navy. But technically, it hadn't been handed over. Final diving trials are scheduled for June 1st following which the Thetis will officially join the Royal Navy's 6th Fleet. June 1, 1939. Leading seaman John Turner leaves for the dockyard amidst the preparations for his sister's upcoming wedding. The Thetis is scheduled to steam out of Liverpool Bay into the Irish Sea, where it is to submerge, resurface, and dive again to periscope depth, finishing the trial with a test firing of the emergency smoke candle. 
Officers from other subs under construction join the Thetis crew to get an idea of what they can expect from this new class of submarine. Among them is Captain Oram of the 5th Submarine Flotilla at Gosport. Also joining the Thetis is the official escort ship Grebcock. Aboard are Lieutenant Coltart and Crosby, two officers from the submarine Taku. The, the, the captain of the submarine offered any passengers, if they wanted to come off, they could come off then, because they had double the amount of crew. Normally they, the submarine carries about 56 personnel, but on this particular day there was 103 persons. That included <laughs> draftsmen, captains of other submarines, they'd all gone out for, for, to see how another submarine worked. Upon reaching open seas, the crew begins their preparations for the initial dive. Working along one another in the engine room are leading stokers T.W. Kenny and Walter Arnold. Well, he was part of the engine room staff. In other words, he was responsible for the mechanical integrity of the vessel. Frank Shaw operates the telemotor control panel, which supplies power for mechanical operations for the entire ship. At 2 p.m. sharp, the order is given to dive. Aboard the Grebcock, Coltart and Crosby hear the hiss of air emanating from the Thetis as her ballast tanks fill with water, but the Thetis remains on the surface. Bolas begins to suspect the forward number five and six torpedo tubes are not flooded, which would account for the excess buoyancy up front. Lieutenant Woods is dispatched to the torpedo room to investigate. Woods decides to verify that water is already present in the tubes through the use of a test cock valve. The way that you told if your, if your torpedo bay was flooded is that there was a little valve in the back of the aft door where you would normally place the torpedo in the torpedo bay. And so you'd open that valve and if, the, 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 if it was flooded, a little trickle of water would come out. Woods opens the test cocks of the number five and six tubes no water appears to be present. But what Woods can't possibly know is that the number five torpedo's test cock holes have been accidentally painted over during construction, concealing the fact that the tube is flooded. And despite the fact that the bow cap indicator reads closed, it is actually open. This was the whole problem. These tubes had to be coated with bitumastic paint and the orifice for the, uh, the drain cock was blocked with grease and a big pad of cotton wool and grease. Woods then attempts to open the rear door of the number five tube, but finds the latch mechanism is jammed. The men struggle to unlatch the rear door, and before anyone realizes what is happening, water quickly floods the forward compartment. As soon as you open the door, it flew open with the pressure of water. And then it flooded that compartment. In the forward machinery space, Stoker Walter Arnold quickly rushes towards the torpedo room. When the incident happened, um, he didn't actually see it, but he could hear the, um, the water coming in and people screaming and shouting and clanging of doors and that sort of thing. So he knew something was a, was a mess. The bow of the submarine became very heavy really heavy. And with the submarine driving forward to try and dive with its dive planes in a down position, then it became an uncontrolled dive very quickly. Bolas quickly orders the main ballast tanks filled with high pressure air to counteract the diving Thetis. But the effort is fruitless. Unable to close the torpedo tube, Woods and the other men retreat to the first watertight bulkhead door. Stoker Arnold arrives and helps Woods and the others in shutting the bulkhead door against the floodwaters, but it won't shut. One of the fastening clips of the bulkhead door has wedged itself between the door and the combing of the sub, preventing the door from closing. The men attempt unsuccessfully to move the clip out of the way and secure the door. With precious seconds ticking by, Woods finally gives the order for the men to fall back to the second watertight bulkhead. When they got to the next bulkhead door, it only had one lever. And with water lapping round the feet and the great pressure of the water, 
against them as it was diving down, they shut that door. And when they shut that door, the whole submarine reverberated because it had landed on the seabed at this time. The nose of the Thetis buries itself in the soft mud of the seafloor, 150 feet below the surface, with its entire front half flooded. Topside, an uneasy feeling grips the men on the Grebcock. Coltart orders the engines stopped and the Grebcock's anchor weighed in an effort to mark the Thetis's last known location. Yet due to the tide and delays in getting the anchor weighed, the Grebcock drifts a full four miles west of where the Thetis actually lies. The Grebcock sends a message to Fort Blockhouse via the receiver station at Seaforth to try and determine the exact details of the Thetis' dive program. But the message is delayed as the messenger dispatched finds himself and his bicycle sidelined with a flat tire. It would be another 70 minutes before anyone would confirm that the Thetis was in trouble. Aboard the Thetis, officers devise a scheme to pump out the flooded compartment. But before the pumps will work, the open rear torpedo tube door must first be shut. This requires someone to swim out the forward escape hatch to the front of the sub, into the torpedo tube to shut the rear door and open the two main line suction valves. It is an extremely dangerous maneuver. Once the chamber is secured from inside the sub, the escape chamber is flooded to equalize the pressure inside, allowing the outer door to be opened and the occupant to swim out. The first volunteer for the assignment is First Lieutenant Chapman. But halfway through the flooding of the escape chamber, Chapman aborts. Because of their depth, the atmospheric pressure inside the chamber becomes too great for him to withstand. Four more attempts are made with the same result. Thoughts turn to simply evacuating through the ship's escape chambers. But with nightfall approaching, it is not a viable option. Sending people out in an open sea without any sign of surface support was almost like signing a death warrant. And the water temperature wouldn't have been altogether that warm, so that quite often, I mean, it's quite possible they would have died of exposure. At 6.15, Coltart's message regarding the Thetis' dive program finally reaches Fort Blockhouse. The Thetis has been down for two hours longer than she was supposed to be. Fearing the worst, all ships in the area are diverted to Thetis's aid. The HMS Brazen, who had been assisting on gunnery trials of another ship in the Irish Sea that day, steams to the Thetis's last known position. By 6.50, four fighter planes are dispatched to locate the Thetis. They are successful. An Anson aircraft overhead spotted the marker boy came down low and relayed it to Fort Blockhouse. The pilot's rough coordinates would put rescue ships within a mile of the Thetis's actual position. But due to an error in calculation, the navigator inadvertently radios in a position that is a full seven miles south-southwest of the Thetis's actual location. Ships begin to correct their course according to the navigator's coordinates. By the time they reach the incorrect position, Night has fallen, and the search is postponed until morning. It doesn't take long for word of the ship's disappearance to make its way around the tiny community of Birkenhead. Among the first to hear the news is the family of leading seaman John Turner. On the 3rd of June, my sister was getting married, and he was coming home after Thetis came up. But on the Thursday night, the 1st of June, the wedding cake was in the house and the police arrived and said that Thetis hadn't surfaced. Well, everybody was in a, a flat spin then. Jean Beattie, daughter of ship's cocker W.B. Beattie, is at a local fish shop with her mother when the news reaches them. This woman came in and she said, oh, she said, do you hear about the submarine? 
The next thing I remember is my mother dragging me by the arm, running, running down Union Street. She was hysterical, and two men got hold of her and took us home. Concerned friends and relatives of the men aboard begin to assemble outside the Camel Laird yard to await any further word on the fate of the ship. We used to have to go down and to the gates of Camel Laird's and uh, wait there to see whether there's any news coming through. Aboard the Thetis, another plan is proposed. By blowing the rear ballast tanks, the submarine's aft end will float up to the surface, thereby getting the escape hatch closer to the surface and reducing the atmospheric pressure. For the plan to work, the aft end of the ship must be lightened, which involves pumping out the ship's rear fresh water and fuel tanks to compensate for the flooded forward compartments. The Camel Laird men must construct a pump system using only existing pipes and whatever they can find aboard the ship. But another problem emerges. Given that the ship has over double her normal complement of men, the oxygen supply on the ship is quickly depleting. The difference then was 18 hours of air for everyone on board versus 36 hours had it only been the crew. By midnight, the effects of oxygen depletion becomes apparent. And it was hard to breathe, and every effort they made was an effort. It was, took them a quarter of an hour to do something that they would do in maybe a couple of minutes. The men worked tirelessly throughout the night. In the early hours of the morning, the stern of the Thetis begins to rise. Friday, June 2nd, dawns with the stern of the Thetis sticking out of the water. All that remains now is for someone to find her. But in the oxygen depleted atmosphere, Bolas is reluctant to wait until ships arrive and decides to begin evacuating the submarine. The first two volunteers are Captain Oram and Lieutenant Woods. A message is strapped to Oram's wrist, detailing a plan for blowing out the Thetis's forward compartments from the surface with high pressure air connected to the ship. Just after 8 a.m., as Woods and Oram are proceeding to the escape chamber, the sound of explosions are heard, alerting the Thetis to the presence of rescue ships. The brazen first located us. It. it took eight hours to steam it up, and it circled round various areas until by dawn it saw the marker board. Word is passed on to family members waiting at Camel Lair, ending a long night of uncertainty and fueling hopes for a speedy rescue. Within minutes, the Thetis escape chamber is flooded and the outer hatch is opened. A welcome shaft of light shines through the porthole of the escape chamber. The men trapped on board the Thetis begin to feel a wave of optimism that they will once again see the surface. They were hopeful, hopeful of a rescue. They, they went in very deep water. The tail was out of the water. And I can imagine after probably 12 hours, they thought, well, rescue must be on the way. Moments later, Oram and Woods reach the surface and are taken aboard the awaiting Brazen. The first evacuation is a success. The plan on Oram's wrist is transmitted to the salvage vessel Vigilant, whose crew quickly prepares to dispatch a diver to connect air hoses to the Thetis. Rescue crews signal the Thetis via Morse code to send the rest of the men out. Lieutenant Commander Bolas decides to double the number of men to be put into the escape chamber. One of them is leading stoker T.W. Kenny. My father went through the routine to flood it up till it was full with uh, seawater. And um, it was up to the people inside then to open the outside hatch and escape. But something goes wrong. No indication of an escape is seen through the hatch's tiny porthole. After 15 minutes, Bolas orders the escape hatch drained and opened. When they drained down and opened up, four people came out. Three of them were drowned and one of them was on the point of expiry. My father did drown, actually, because he drowned in the escape hatch. 
if they've got the submarine up, my father wouldn't have been alive because he was put in with four other um, men into the escape hatch. When they opened the hatch, he tumbled out dead. The only survivor utters that the outer escape hatch is jammed before finally losing consciousness. Topside, the crews of the Brazen and the Vigilant are reluctant to draw closer to the Thetis for fear of blocking the men's route to the surface. Aboard the Vigilant, plans to dispatch the diver to connect air hoses to the Thetis are waylaid by tidal undercurrents, which make it unsafe for diving. Although the Thetis is surrounded by three ships, including the escort tug Grebcock, they are powerless to assist those on board as precious minutes tick away and oxygen on the Thetis dwindles. Despite the setback, Bolas decides to push ahead with the escape effort. The captain of the ship then said to my father, would you like to have a go? Well, you can imagine it was a stark choice. There were four people who just died. The people who were remaining were in a pretty poor state. And it was a case of, well, should I die trying to get out or should I die just waiting here for someone to rescue me? Arnold is accompanied by Frank Shaw. As the chamber is prepared, Arnold walks Shaw through the escape procedure. Frank Shaw, being a civilian, had no idea whatsoever of how the machinery worked and, and the, the breathing apparatus. So he had to place himself entirely in my father's hands. While they were waiting for the, the water to, to rise up, it instructed Frank Shaw that one part of the breathing mechanism was a small valve on the, on the set, on the breathing set. A valve had to be open as he rose, otherwise the pressure would build up in your lung and would, you would burst your lungs. When the upper hatch was opened and they were free to go out into the sea, Frank Shaw went through first. But my father noticed that this little valve hadn't been opened. Arnold grabs for Shaw's relief valve, trying to open it before his lungs burst from depressurization. Well, Frank Shaw, of course, didn't know what was happening. He thought he'd been trapped by the foot, so he lashed out, as you would. Um, my father had to sort of contend with him lashing out while he was opening this little valve. Arnold manages to release Shaw's DSEA valve, but quickly finds that he is having problems of his own. Because of the poor atmosphere that he just left and the pure oxygen that he just starting to breathe it made him sick he vomited into the, the mouthpiece so he actually started to drown aboard the brazen captain mills sees shaw as he reaches the surface tense moments pass as he waits for the second man to appear at last stoker arnold reaches the surface coughing and gagging following his underwater ordeal like Frank Shaw, he is quickly pulled aboard the rescue ship. Realizing that time is running out, Captain Mills orders wreckmaster Charles Brock to remove one of the rear manholes in an attempt to get air to the men. Brock's hammered up onto the tail end there, loosened some bolts, a hiss of air came out, he didn't know what was happening. He quickly uh, screwed them down again. He didn't know what damage was doing, what was happening at all. Before another plan can be formulated, the Thetis begins to sink. At 3.10 p.m. on June 2nd, the Thetis disappears beneath the waves, claiming 99 lives. At the, the final inquest, they found the escape, uh, the escape hatch open, jammed open. Somebody inside the ship must have got thinking that the men might have been escaped or what, I don't know. But they opened the door and the sea came in. Back in Birkenhead, news of the Thetis' demise reaches four-year-old Joyce Turner and her family, moments after the marriage of Joyce's older sister. What I remember is that nobody would tell me what was going on, wearing a, a lovely silk dress being a bridesmaid and all that happiness has suddenly changed and gone into uh, everybody crying and I just didn't know what was going on. 
my sister, she was 22, 23, she got hold of me. And, you know, she got hold, I can remember her kissing me. And she said, you won't see your dad anymore. I couldn't get it together, I, I kept saying, but he said, I'll see him tomorrow. And she kept saying, no, you won't see him anymore. A few weeks later, a formal memorial service is held for the men who died on board. It was going out to lay wreaths over the spot where Thetis lay. And then I heard somebody say, they're all down there. And I realized that my brother was down there. He was under all that water. And I thought he'd come back. I always thought that he would come back. Salvagers dragged the Thetis to shore on September 9th, 1939, three months after she originally sank. The Thetis was beached at uh, Anglesey, and the owner's task of extracting the bodies uh, had to be undertaken. My brother, he actually went to Hollyhead to try and identify my father, but um, the bodies were unrecognizable, but he identified him by seven lucky charms he had in his pocket. A month later, an official inquiry is held to try and determine the cause. Tests on the telemotor mechanism of the Thetis reveal that the bow cap of the number five tube opened itself, explaining how the outer cap was opened despite the fact that the indicator had been switched to closed prior to the opening of the tube. It also strongly criticized Captain Bolas for not ordering the 44 passengers off the ship. As a result, the neutral position is eliminated from all submarine systems. It also sees the implementation of a safety system for the back of torpedo doors. After that, they invented what was called a Thetis clip. You could start to undo the inside door, and if there was water in, it would force it against this clip, so therefore you couldn't lift it over to open the door fully. The Thetis is repaired and sent back into active duty, this time as the HMS Thunderbolt. Four years later, the Thunderbolt was sunk in the Mediterranean Sea, and strangely, it reared its stern out of the water, just like the old Thetis, and went down into the depths. But this time, it was gone forever. Over 60 years later, echoes of the disaster still linger within the families of the victims. The whole nation, I think, was shocked because this was the biggest submarine disaster we'd ever known. There was a lot of shock. Shock and surprise that something like that should go wrong, Some, something so simple. Yes, it was um, anger, really, anger. The general feeling was they could have rescued them, they could have got the people out. There must be no more secrecy when a submarine goes down. The men must come first. This tragedy at sea, a seemingly needless loss of life, foreshadows another that would occur on the other side of the world nearly 30 years later. The Vietnam of the early 60s was one marred by ideological division and political instability. Having driven out the French only years earlier, General Ho Chi Minh mounts his pursuit of a unified communist Vietnam against the Democratic South. By 1967, American forces in Vietnam total 500,000 troops. They are assisted by constant airstrikes facilitated through the use of aircraft carriers. The, uh, the carrier has, has kind of evolved uh, into uh, being kind of like the forward arm of a defense establishment. These are the striking units with their escorts and other vessels are, uh, are the spear point of any kind of a naval operation. In June of 1967, the USS Forrestal, an attack class aircraft carrier, is deployed from Norfolk, Virginia to join the 7th Fleet, stationed in the Gulf of Tonkin on its first ever combat mission. 
With over 5,000 men on board and a complement of 80 fighter jets and three aircraft hangar bays, the Forestal is quite literally a floating city. There were more people on that ship than there were in my hometown. If you took the ship and stood it up on end from stern to bow, it's um, about the same size as the Empire State Building. It's huge. Arriving at Yankee Station in the Gulf of Tonkin on July 25th, under the command of Captain John K. Beeling, the Forrestal wastes no time in launching airstrikes into North Vietnam. We were flying Alpha Strikes. That's every plane that would fly, loaded as much ordnance and fuel on that plane to make it strike and we shot them off about every four to six hours, depending on how fast we could get things turned over. July 28th, 1967. Under the cover of darkness, an ammunition supply ship restocks the dwindling supply of bombs aboard the Forestal. Among those unloading and stowing explosives on the loading deck are Seaman Kenneth Kilmare. My division, which was part of the deck division, had received ammunition from an ammunition ship that came alongside of us. During the unloading of the munitions, gun boss Commander Chisholm discovers that there is some cause for concern. For me and a fire marshal were waltzing up and down the hangar bays as the armor was coming on board. And that's when these deadly 1,000 pound bombs came on, 26 came on. Commander Chisholm notified the captain that they were World War II variety and he wanted to send them back. Upon hearing the news, Captain Beeling makes a request to have the World War II ordnance removed from his ship, concerned about the older munitions' volatility. The captain got on the phones to the captain of the ammo ship and the ammo ship captain told him, it's your fair share, take them and get rid of them. Among the flight deck crew unloading the ancient ordnance is 20-year-old seaman James Root. We uh, broke away from our replenishments just hours prior to the starting to load up for the first alpha strike of the day. At daybreak on July 29th, the first strike jets for North Vietnam. It is loaded with 13 of the 26 World War II vintage bombs. The second strike armed with the 13 remaining bombs, prepares for takeoff. Among those involved in the second strike that day are fighter pilots John S. McCain and Robert Browning, who proceed to their waiting planes. In the ship's mess hall, seaman Ken Kilmayer takes a moment to write a letter home after working the night shift. One deck below, Assistant Fire Marshal Jerry Johnson gets prepared for the day. James Root decides to retire after his work on the night shift. It was a quiet time. Um, just finished loading for that first one, uh, the first launch. I had a couple hours of downtime, so I read a little bit and went to bed. Browning and McCain complete their final pre-flight checks as the first plane of the second strike prepares for takeoff. Then, something goes terribly wrong. Upon ignition, flame fires from the engine of the A-4 Seahawk in what is known as a hot start. The flame ignites a missile on the wing of the plane behind it. The missile flies across the flight deck, striking Lieutenant Commander McCain's fighter jet, rupturing his fuel tank, and causing hundreds of gallons of jet fuel to flood the deck. The exhaust from the rocket, of course, it went right through the belly tank, and since they don't uh have to travel a certain distance before they arm themselves. It didn't blow up, but its rocket motor ignited the fuel. The pilots and ground crew suddenly find themselves surrounded by a giant wall of flame. McCain and Browning evacuate their planes immediately amidst the sudden inferno. Deck Chief Gerald Ferrier instantly grabs a fire extinguisher and rushes into the blaze to prevent it from spreading. He attempted to put the first 1,000 pounder that was dropped into a belly tank of gas that was ignited, and uh, he attempted to put it out with a PKP extinguisher. Captain Beeling immediately sounds the general quarters alarm. 
Men below begin to respond to the alarm. Among them, leading Petty Officer First Class, Milt Crutchley. Our radar room was located just inboard of the one gun sponsor. So when fire went on the flight deck, my first response was, well, I'm going to go see what's going on. And I went out the hatch to climb up on top of the gun mounts. The general alarm, which is a bong, 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 all hands man your battle stations, your general quarters stations. Below decks, many think that the general quarters alarm is a drill and disregard it. I got used to hearing that so much as a drill that when they actually sounded it saying this is not a drill, it didn't register. And I really literally rolled over. The second time it went off, obviously then instinct starts kicking in from the training. Out of the bunk, shoes on, clothes on, grab my shirt, running up the first set of stairs. Fire crews attempt to douse the flame with a combination of conventional water hoses and a firefighting substance known as fog foam. It's spread over the top of, of burning fuel or fuel so it doesn't ignite, takes the oxygen away, starving it from oxygen, therefore not, not letting it burn. But water from the hoses washes the fog foam away. Unable to contain the fire with water hoses, fire crews can't prevent the flames from spreading. Temperatures around the World War II issue bombs continue to climb. The fire on the Forrestal's flight deck catches many by surprise. Despite the mounting effort to quell the flames, the fire continues to grow. Then, the inevitable. One of the World War II bombs explodes. When the first explosion went off and literally blew three of us that were on the stairs from the percussion back down the stairs. And I'm thinking to myself, it's happening very fast. I'm thinking this is not right. Deck Chief Gerald Ferrier is never seen again. He attempted to put the fire out with a PKP extinguisher, which is, in a lot of people's opinion, ridiculous. And like I say, he, he did something on his own because he, he just he was trained to do it. Miraculously, pilots McCain and Browning make it through the inferno with only minor shrapnel wounds. John was able to crawl out of his aircraft and, and escape the flames forward because they were sweeping out. He wasn't injured seriously at all. Seconds after the first, the second thousand pound bomb explodes, killing those rushing to man the fire hoses. We really had no idea what was going on initially. We knew there was a fire, but we didn't know what started the fire. And then there was a bomb blast, so you didn't know what started that either. Nine bombs erupt over the course of only a few minutes, leaving the aft end of the flight deck consumed in flame. The explosions leave gaping holes in the flight deck, allowing the spilling jet fuel and unsecured bombs to fall into the lower decks. One bomb fell in another hole, chain reaction just kept on exploding down and down. And then the fuel fell inside the bomb holes. It cut the three-inch armor-plated steel like a knife through butter. Men en route to their general quarter stations are diverted to fight the fires that now blaze on the flight deck and in the hangar bays. James Root makes his way to his general quarters station, but is diverted by a senior officer as he reaches the hangar deck. He grabbed me by the scuff of the neck and hired two other men to go back into the hangar deck Jerry Johnson is also diverted to help fight the fire on deck. I saw the, lots of black smoke, lots of confusion, lots of screaming and hollering. Others manage to arrive at their general quarters stations, only to await orders that never come. Milt Crutchley and fellow crew members Ron Grayson and Joe Labine find themselves in Hangar Bay 3, where fire has begun to erupt. We still didn't really 100% sure know what was going on. And by the time they said it was okay to leave, we had fire above us, and we had fire behind us, and we had fire out in the hangar deck, which was just inboard of us. Captain Beeling sends a distress signal to all ships in the area and orders anything explosive jettisoned from the Forrestal. Ken Kilmayer is diverted from his general quarter station to assist efforts in the hangar bay. 
There is total movement in this hangar bay to get aircraft moved forward that were back aft. Some aircraft were jettisoned, and I immediately started helping in that. Everybody was helping. James Root is also in the hangar bay, doing things he never thought he'd do in the rush to jettison explosives. We were breaking every rule that we were taught on how to handle ordnance, literally dropping it on the ground, pulling the fuses out of them and rolling bombs off the side of the ship, things you shouldn't have been doing. But under the circumstances, we had no other way of doing it. Firefighting efforts begin below decks as men scramble to contain the flames from spreading any further. They needed help back aft in Hangar Bay 3. I went back there along with some other guys from my division. I got an OBA and I got on a hose team. Crutchley, Grayson, and Labine are hemmed into their general quarter station by flame. They turn to the only escape route open to them. The three of us decided to try for the gun sponsor because we figured that if nothing else, we could go over the side of the ship and we'd have fresh air, take our chances out there with whatever. And that's when we discovered that one of the guys that did maintenance on the crane, there was a guy hanging on the hook. Crutchley and the others attempt to get the stranded man off the crane. One of the arresting gear cable had been blown down from the flight deck across the gun spots and then over onto this crane arm. So the three of us decided, well, let's slide down that cable, get on the crane, and we'll get that guy up off the hook, and then we'll decide what we're going to do from there. As they reach the stranded sailor on the crane, other ships in the area arrive to aid the stricken Forrestal, including the USS Rupertus and the USS Diamond Head. About that time, one of the destroyers pulled up alongside, and they wanted to know if we were going to jump. And most likely, we would have, the three of us would have been sucked into somebody's uh, screws. And that would have been the last anybody would have seen of us. Milt Crutchley, Joe Labine, and Ron Grayson try to figure out how to get to safety as they dangle on the crane hook 50 feet above the waters of the Gulf of Tonkin. We realized that the control arm for the crane ran directly from the flight deck down to the hook and had two little control cables on either side of the control arm. And to us, it sort of looked like, you know, the stairway to heaven. So I told Ron and Joe, go up the control arm to the flight deck, and you know, just hold on the cables and, and walk about here. After a precarious crossing, the men finally make it to the flight deck. And we hadn't gotten 60 seconds away from that control arm when one of the last fuel tanks blew and covered the area where we had just been with burning jet plane. So another 60 seconds, and we'd all been burned alive or whatever. Twelve hours after the fire has broken out, the Forestall blaze is finally brought under control. Smaller fires smolder below decks, which are so intensely hot, crews have difficulty fighting them. The wounded Forestall begins to steam towards Subic Bay in the Philippines. En route, many of the men literally collapse from exhaustion. A lot of the crew were up all night, worked harder than they, well, probably a lot of them ever worked in their lives, and they were exhausted. And the after third of the ship had been burned out, so they didn't have any place to go to sleep. The body count yields 134 dead and 64 wounded as the Forestall sets in for repairs. With the immediate danger of the fire behind them, crew members begin to feel the full effect of the disaster. We were safe. We were heading to port. We lost a lot of people. The senses start to kick in, and you have the fire odors, fog foam odors, flesh odors, those things affect you today. So then you get this kind of a feeling of guilt. And I carried that for a long, long time. Eventually that feeling of guilt turns more into a feeling of, I guess indebtedness is, is the only word I use, that you owed something to the guys that did get killed. In the aftermath of the tragedy, several important lessons emerge from the Forestall disaster. The hangar deck, for example, uh, now has uh, greater fire doors that react more quickly and, uh, and are paid more respect to, I'd say. 
Firefighting training courses also become mandatory for every sailor entering the Navy, not just designated firemen. Yet for the hundreds of survivors, that fateful July day in 1967 lives on, serving for many as a constant reminder of the preciousness and fragile gift of life. And you are motivated to honor those who weren't as lucky as myself. We dedicate this reef to all our shipmates from the far stall, and may God continue to bless them. Such is the nature of the sea. As it takes, so too does it provide. And through this symbiotic exchange, we will always maintain at least a symbolic connection with those lost at sea. <laughs>